Okay, well, welcome everybody to Solar Noon Tuesday. And uh, my name is Jay Warnke with solarpvtraining.com. And what we do in these sessions, this is, there are folks who are joining us live, but we also record these. So you may be looking at it on YouTube. But what we try and do is recap every week, although over the summer, we're doing it every two weeks, um, what's happening in the world of solar, then I highlight whatever events, whatever webinars, conferences, things like that, that are coming up. Uh, that are, are attuned to the solar interest, uh, you know, over the next few weeks. So we'll highlight those. And then we go into a deep dive on a specific topic, uh, something that I found interesting in the last week or something that uh, someone who participates has suggested. So that's kind of the format. Today, what we're doing, we're going to um, look back. Uh, in 2012, I published a book called When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine. And it was about the history, the present, and the future of energy, energy systems. Really takes it from 1492 um, up to the present day at that point, and then tried to project 10, 15 years into the future. Well, it's 10, 15 years into the future, and I just thought it would be fun to look back and see um, how badly I did. So, But before we get into that, let's go ahead and um, touch on the news for the week. Okay, so this is the week of July 1st, 2024. And it may seem fairly intuitive, but uh, that the longest day of the year would actually be the day that um, uh, generated the most solar. And um, it turns out that it does, and it is um, actually um, June 20th. Now it says June 21st, but this year it was June 20th at 8.50 uh, Granite Mean Time was the summer solstice. This is the point when the tilt of the Earth's axis uh, faces most directly to the sun. So it's the longest day in the in the Northern Hemisphere, the day with the most sunlight. And apparently 90% of all the world's solar panels are in the Northern Hemisphere. So on that day, 90% of the solar panels were receiving the most uh, amount of sunlight. Uh, so folks who study these things, uh, in a research firm called Ember, they found that on the solstice, about 20% of the world's electricity was going was generated by uh, solar. That's up from about 16% a year ago. And for the month of June of this year, actually about 8% of the world's uh, energy is going to be generated through solar. So how does the U.S. stack up in this uh, summer solstice race? Well, for the month of June, the U.S. is expected to receive about 7% of its electricity from solar. That's up uh, 2% from 5% uh, last year. China is going to get about 10% from solar. The European Union, about 20%. And Spain, at the moment, is the global leader in all of this. And they're anticipating 30% of their energy supply will come from solar in the month of June of this year. Now, environmentalists had some harsh criticism for PJM's uh, recent filing on how they plan to um, comply with the new rules for interconnection from FERC. Uh, PJM is the largest uh, regional transmission authority. Uh, they control how the grid operates in a region that goes pretty much all the way from New York City to Chicago, as this map indicates. I think PJM stands for, if I remember, um, Pennsylvania, Jersey, and Maryland. I think that's what it stands for. Anyway, in 2022, PJM instituted a pause on accepting all new applications for very large um, power generating facilities connected to the grid. Most of these in this environment are wind and solar. And this pause is not anticipated to be lifted until sometime in 2026. So it turns out like a four year pause. Well, in recent years, there's been a huge backlog in the requests for generating facilities, primarily wind and solar, that are going to be connected to the grid. In fact, currently, there's 2.6 terawatts of projects in the queue. To give you a sense of perspective, that's twice as much as the existing electrical generating capacity on the grid today. So if all of these were installed, essentially, grids generating would triple. Uh, and once a um, application has been accepted by regional transit, a transmission authority, it can take as much as four years for them to work that application through the process. So, so the question is, why does it take so long? 
Well, typically when a filing is made, first the developer has to go ahead and apply to, to the Regional Transit Authority, um, then, uh, not transit, transmission. Uh, then they have to prove that they've uh, secured the land for this project. They have to pay a substantial deposit and these deposits have gone up dramatically in recent years. Then they have to a grid feasibility study. And that basically says, can the grid at this location actually handle or, or take the power that this system is going to generate? Then they have to pay for a, a grid impact study saying, OK, if it can take it, what's the impact on the grid? Then they have to pay for a facilities study, which basically says, all right, well, we've decided what the impact is. Now we got to figure out what pieces of equipment we have to actually um, purchase and upgrade and things like that in order to make this thing happen. Once all of that is done, then they form an agreement between the utility and the developer. Then typically the developer has to pay for the um, necessary upgrades on the grid. Kind of like, I think the analogy is like, if you decide you're going to add a certain number of vehicles to the highway system, it would be like saying you now have to pay for the new lanes on the highway. It's, it's a bit strange the way that works. All right, well, this is time consuming, expensive, and, and as a result, most developers end up uh, withdrawing their application before it ever gets through the process. So earlier this year, FERC, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, they came up with new rules for how these regional authorities have to handle interconnection. The idea is they wanted to speed it up because four years, two to four years is just way too long given that we are in an energy transition. And they also want to make it less expensive. Well, PJM just filed their report saying, okay, you know what, how they're going to comply with this. They said, you know what, we'll comply with everything except for the things we don't want to comply with, which is pretty much everything. So that, that was their response. We'll see how that works out. All right, the U.S. storage market grew 84% in the first um, quarter. Uh, somebody just asked, is there a rationale for the PJM cost? Their argument was, they're just simply too many. We can't handle them. So, so don't even apply, because it's taking us too long to even look at them. So we're just not going to look at it until 2026. That's kind of their rationale. Um, so the storage uh, market just grew 84%. Um, in the first quarter of 2024 over quarter one of 2023, adding 1.265 gigawatts of capacity, according to a report by American Clean Power Association. Uh, Nevada, California, and Texas accounted for about 90% of all of the storage added to the grid. Uh, the storage market has been surging in recent years. In 2023, developers and utilities added 6.4 gigawatts of storage to the grid. That's an increase of 70% over the previous year. And in 2024, EIA projects 14.3 uh, gigawatts of new storage. So you do the math, it's more than double. Um, it's gonna actually account for 23% of all of the new generating capacity added to the grid this year. Now, residential storage is still growing, but at a much more modest pace of about 8% in the first quarter of this year over the fourth quarter of last year. And there were a couple of legislative wins here recently in the last couple of weeks. In Minnesota, uh, they passed a, a new law called, let's see, the Minnesota Energy Infrastructure Permitting Act. This deals with interconnection for a large, um, for a large part. They're basically saying, okay, we wanna do what these other groups are saying they wanna do, which is speed up the process, reduce the time they anticipate this law will reduce the uh, connection time, the permitting time by six to nine months. Uh, and they also set a goal of 100% renewable energy by the year 2040. Now in Michigan, there was a ballot initiative that was underway um, to overturn the 2023 Clean Energy Future Plan, which did effectively what Minnesota is trying to do now, which was to speed up the interconnection process, the permitting process, and it set a goal of 100% uh, renewable by 2040. Um, they were trying to overturn it. Uh, I looked online, there were a bunch of uh, natural gas and you know the, the, the usual suspects were behind this. Unfortunately, or fortunately, they were unable to secure enough uh, signatures 
to get this on the ballot. So that's that's something that everybody was like, yay, we won, I guess. You know, all right. Well, anyway, so that's the news from the solar industry for these past two weeks. Um, so anybody have anything you want to add to that uh, as we, before I jump into the events of this week? Saw some comments floating through in the chat. Well, I just read this morning that um, Michigan passed a law that HOAs can't stop solar now, like the Ohio law. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. good. Yeah, HOAs are homeowners associations. So that's usually a, a big thing. You know, if you're in a homeowners association and they say, we don't want solar, you know, so there are a number, of, I, I forget how many states, but uh, say that you cannot arbitrarily block solar. That's kind of what they're saying. They can still have some things that restrict it, but you just can't outright ban it. They said 29 states or? 29? Oh, well, that's good. Yeah. That's good. So, all right. Anything else uh, for the good of the cause there? All right. Well, let me jump into some of the events here in the coming weeks, uh, what we're going to, uh, uh, June 5th and 6th. Okay. I, I don't know why that's still there. No. Okay. I'm looking at my notes up top and this is, yeah, July 16th, Agrivoltaics. This is from CEA. So there's a webinar there, Agrivoltaics. Uh, then there's the RE Plus Mid-Atlantic Conference coming up July 18th and 19th. That's going to be in Philadelphia. On the 23rd, uh, there's a webinar about Fronius uh, Gen 24. So uh, this is this might be interesting to folks. Uh, Fronius, one of the leading string inverter uh, manufacturers, is actually coming out with their new line of uh, residential inverters. So um, the dominant players in the marketplace are Enphase and Solar Edge, but we're starting to see some from, say, Generac, and also from uh, Sunny Boy uh, SMA. And Fronius. So Fronius has got a new product out. Might be interesting to see what that is. Uh, the 25th, 2 p.m., healthcare benefits uh, for folks, I guess, uh, any business, but this is focused on solar from CEA. And uh, really not a lot of things happening um, this month in webinars, but I will shamelessly plug our online courses and our, uh, uh, there, we have some in person and also virtual. And then I thought, speaking of shamelessly plugging, our new edition of the Level 1 textbook should be coming out shortly. I was hoping it would be out by now, but apparently I am in the grips of AI Wonderland. Um, I, I sent this thing off to the publisher slash printer, and they came back saying I violated some things because apparently there's a book out there that has similar content. I wrote back saying, yeah, that would be the eighth edition of this textbook. How about having a human being look at this? Um, you know, I think um, so. So they say in six to eight weeks, they'll get back to me. So isn't that lovely? So anyway, we'll see how that works. I'll, hopefully they'll get a live human being instead of a uh, a scanning bot that tells me that I'm violating stuff or I'm plagiarizing my own work. So that would be interesting. Um, so so that's um, those are the events. Um, before I jump into uh, the topic for this week, anybody, I'll give you an op opportunity to jump in, give your latest complaint about AI, just like me. So. I've, I've done a lot of project or presentations about AI talking about the wonders of it. And I guess I forgot that it's just going to be annoying for a good long time. You know, there's going to be all of this stuff that just makes your life annoying because everybody's going to follow it like they follow their GPS as they drive into a wheat field, you know, because they just assume it has to be right. <laughs> but All right. So I, I just it occurred to me it would be fun um, to to look back. Um, at the predictions that I made in 2012. In 2012, I published this book called When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine. And, and I did send out um, links on your invitation if you want to get a copy of it. I think it's still quite a good book. Um, it's one of those, you know, kind of bathroom books where you could read it at five minutes at a time. Although as we get older, the bathroom breaks may be longer than five minutes. Well, I'll leave that up to you. But um, it uh, really talks about the history, the present, and the future of energy. 
Uh, and, and I found it fascinating that this cycle that we have with energy is we develop an energy source, we use it until we pretty much exhausted it. And then miraculously something else emerges and it becomes the new energy source. So we've had a lot of peak wood, peak charcoal, peak coal, peak oil, peak natural gas, you know, we'll probably, who knows, peak solar at some point. Um, you know, we just seem good at that. And and it's I say miraculously, but I think it's more economically that as something starts to run out, the incentives, the economic incentives are to develop an alternative. And as that alternative develops, the prices come down and then it becomes cheaper. So um, that's a so this is um, so so let's look through these predictions. OK, and I'll give you a little bit of background on it. When I was doing the projections, I, I really spent a lot of time focusing on this. And bear in mind, again, this is back in 2012. And, and I tried to make these projections and then I went back and kind of ramped them up a bit because I didn't think they were aggressive enough. Um, and, and so I, at the time when this book came out, I was actually doing a lot of, uh, you know, talk shows and, and, you know, events and promotion and all of that. And, and I will say that most people thought I was pretty wackadoodle um, as far as these projections. Everybody was like poo-pooing it, saying, oh, dear boy, you don't know what you're talking about. So, so bear in mind, at the moment this, these came out, these were considered extremely unlikely and extremely aggressive. So anyway, first prediction, I thought pretty, pretty easy to predict. Coal, coal down, natural gas up. So... Um, so what, what I did, um, if you look at how the US was generating electricity at that time, about 37% of our power came from coal. About 30% came from natural gas. Hydro about you know 7% more or less. Wind, 3%. Solar you know, didn't exist. It just didn't exist, really. Um, nuclear, nuclear there at, what, 19%? So it was really a battle between coal, natural gas, and nuclear. Those, those were the main things. Hydro was sitting around 7%, uh, kind of where it's been. The, the amount of hydro has remained pretty stable since um, 1945, um, but the percentage of generation continually declines. Uh, the 7% in 2012 represented about 80% or 85% in, in 1945, but it was the same the same amount of hydro. It's just that there was very little else. So, um, okay, so this is where we were. So my prediction here was that we would see a massive shift from a diminishing of coal and an elevating of natural gas. And, and in the book, I give you a lot of reasons for this, talking about peak coal, talking about how there was a bunch of hype about fracking and, and at the moment, and fracking was brand new at that time. And I just said, all right, I think natural gas, because the distribution mechanism is the same, the pricing incentives are the same, all of that, that's going to happen. But the real going out on limb thing was pushing renewables up to 20%. You know, that was, and we get into that a little bit different, a little bit more later. So this is what I published in the book. It's by 2020, this is where we would be in our generating capacity. This is where we actually are. Um, so natural gas, 44, and I've got a slide here. I'll show you how they match up, but uh, I'm, uh, the next slide, I'm just bragging, you know, cause, cause we just kind of go look at how good I was. All right. Here's the prediction, 47%, the actual 44.5%, coal, 17%, actual 20.8%. So I thought gas was going to go a little bit more, not much. Nuclear, pretty close. Hydro, yeah, relatively close. Oil, really close, and renewables. Renewables, we hit 20.5% instead of 20%. So, so uh, remarkably, and, and to tell you, I know um, uh, it was asked, how do you make these predictions and how are you gonna, you know, if you're trying to predict the future. What, what I did for the most part on these is said, what's a realistic growth rate and how does that compound itself, you know, over time? And these are the numbers I ended up on. You know, it's just kind of like you don't just pull a number out of the air, but you say, all right, well, I think natural gas is going to increase 7% a year, whatever coal is going to diminish 4% a year, and, and, and you end up with that. So, um, okay. Predict oh, I'll, I'll ask you guys to comment. 
any any comments on that other than to just say, well done, Jay, you're so smart. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, apparently, no one wants to tell me I'm smart. Okay, so the next one was uh, the end of cheap natural gas. And, and this one got me a bunch of pushback at the time as well, because we were right in the middle of the fracking hype. You know, fracking was the future of the universe. Um, there was a conference here in Ohio where they said we were going to have 200,000 natural gas jobs in the state of Ohio. It was, and, and the speaker even said, this is a slam dunk. You know, anytime someone tells you it's a slam dunk, you just, okay, hold on to your wallet walk away because there's no such thing as a slam dunk. Um, so, so what was the projection here? Well, I did project that natural gas would have to rise from $3.50 um, for, for a therm or a, what is that, a million BTUs, um, to between eight and $12 per million BTUs. And so if we look at actually what happened here, you can see that natural gas was pretty volatile. Started out at the three and a half bucks or so back in 2012. It actually shot up to eight bucks a, a, a therm right away, really within two years, which was interesting. Um, but then of course it fell back down. Now it's back up eight or nine dollars. Um, I, I would still say I was pretty accurate on this. I'm going to give myself a win on here, but I'm going to, I've got another prediction later uh, that sort of explains why the price dropped in the mid range and why it was completely um, un, there was no logic to this price drop uh, and essentially bankrupted the industry. So um, anyway, so, so that's, that's what happened. Uh, the prices did go up. And, and when I get to, um, to why, uh, a little bit later, you'll find that it had to go. Uh, the prediction there I thought was pretty pretty obvious. And, and really, I'll, I'll sort of foreshadow here. Notice I said uh, it's going to go up between $8 and $12 because $8 a therm is where you start to make money. I mean, just looking at cost of production, if you're not charging 8 bucks, you're losing money. So clearly, you can't sell at a loss. For that long, um, but they did, <laughs> and then they lost money. All right, this was my third prediction: the cost of electricity will double within seven years. Um, I'm going to give myself a strong fail on this one. Um, I and what I was really projecting here is I was anticipating, for a lot of different reasons, about a 10% increase per year in the cost of electricity, um, which. The rule of seven, basically, if it's 10% with compounding, you're going to get a doubling every set, every seven years. Um, what did actually happen during that time period is the average retail electric price went from 11 cents uh, a kilowatt hour to about 13 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, I was talking to Annie about these predictions this morning, and it was like, you know what, maybe I was just a few years too soon because it seems like electricity is going up 10% a year um, all of a sudden in the last few years. Uh, but if I were making a prediction, I would have said by now electricity prices will be going down because logically they should be going down because the cost of energy is going down as people transition to renewable. But utilities don't follow logic. Um, they follow greed and corruption. All right, so... Prediction number four, the nuclear industry, nuclear power is dead. And, and that one, yeah, <laughs> you know, um, it, 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 I found this, this chart here is kind of interesting. If you look at um, power plants being built here in the United States, nuclear power plants, um, it's, it's just obvious. And, and it was obvious to me in 2012, 2011, when I was writing the book, um, nuclear is far and away the most expensive form of electricity. So why would you be investing in the most expensive option when there are better alternatives? Uh, plus, you get all of the negatives that are associated with the nuclear industry and the problems with um, 
with the disposal of waste, uh, with the, the risk of nuclear accident. So, you know, it's that old joke about what do you call a renewable energy spill? You know, a nice day. You know, that's Those are, there just are not the downside risks that you run into with a nuclear power plant. And what we've seen periodically throughout uh, the nuclear age is there's a little bit more of a, a bump. You know, people start going, you know, maybe this is a good option. And then there's a disaster. There's like uh, Three Mile Island, everything fell back off. Then there's Chernobyl, everything fell back off. Fukushima, everything falls back off. So, you know, the next one certainly would be a death nail, but I don't even think we need the next one because the costs, the costs are just out of control. Uh, the only people really working or pushing nuclear are those people looking for government grants. Yeah, Pete, you got a question? Yeah, the other thing that people frequently overlook on nuclear power is that we live in an age now with more renewable energy online, where what the power um, generating and distributing company, companies want is dispatchable energy. In the nuclear plants, at least those run by XL Energy in Minnesota, that's a four day startup cycle. And I don't know what they have as far as a shutdown cycle, but it's just so far from dispatchable that they run at 100% power, whether there's a need for power or not. Mm -hmm. And what the industry is looking for is dispatchable power when the need backs off or the solar and wind pick up to shut down the plants. And they just can't do that with the nuclear. Yeah, they've always argued that nuclear and coal, to a lesser extent, make good base load, you know, because it is something you can't just turn on and turn off. That's the beauty of batteries, because batteries are like, boom, instantaneous. They can You can dispatch it, turn it off, dispatch it, turn it off. There's instantaneous. Natural gas pretty pretty fast. It's like turning the burner of your stove on. It 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 can be a couple of hours versus days. Um, so natural gas has been used as peaker plants, you know, to be that kind of to to moderate the the variation in demand. Uh, but really, battery is where to go. And we're starting to see wind and solar becoming base load because it's fairly predictable. Um, you know, and, and it's inexpensive. So you want your base load to be your cheapest and, and then right. use battery, um, you know, to even that out. And that's where we're moving, but it's going to take, what, 10, 15 years in order to work through all, get rid of all the aging power plants, because you don't just throw it away just because you got a better choice. You know, they're going to, they're going to milk that, as they say, they, um, they milk that cow a bit too hard, you know, they're, that's what they're going to do there is they're, they're going to keep at it. Um, there was something, oh, now what they're promoting. Now the nuclear industry is promoting small nuclear um, and they're really trying to pair it with data centers and AI. Um, you, you're even seeing some of the tech bros going out there and saying, you know what, this would be great. We can move our AI out there into the wilderness. We can have our own little nuclear power plant, you know, that's the size of a tractor trailer and, and you know, this is unlimited, but it's also, it's also a pipe dream. You know, the costs, the costs associated with it are just so astronomical that they're going to come back and say, okay, well, I can spend a billion dollars on this, or I can spend, you know, 50 million and get it through solar. So what are you going to do? You know, they're going to go solar. And, and that's just, and it's always economics. Econo economics is always what trumps it. But nuclear is definitely dead. But it, it's it's sort of like riding the back of a tiger. You know, it, it's you can't get off. You know, the nuclear power plants that already exist are difficult to um, to shut down, and there's a long process. But a lot of them are in the process of being decommissioned. But it is it is a long, expensive process to shut these things down. So, um, so don't expect them to go away right away, but, but they, uh, it is an aging fleet and, and it is disappearing. And I do not anticipate any new ones being built here in the United States. Just doesn't make sense. They just did this down in Georgia. It, uh, they added a reactor. Um, it was a fiasco, the cost overruns, the delays. It, it's just, anytime you touch it, it just, it's, it's a bad, it's bad news. All right. <laughs> Excuse me. Prediction number five: uh, Wind energy comes of age. Okay, this one I, I felt was pretty easy to uh, to project. 
But uh, over the next seven years, wind generating capacity will triple and it will become the source of between five to 6% of the nation's energy. So that's a quote that I pulled out of the book, um, which seemed super aggressive at the time. And it turns out I did kind of, you know, over promise slightly. Uh, it, what ended up happening is it took nine years instead of seven years to triple. And but it was generating 8.62% rather than the, uh, what did I just say, uh, five to 6%. So under promised on the percentage of the grid, over promised on the fact that it would triple. Uh, it, it was nine years instead of seven years. So pretty, um, pretty good. And uh, um, oh yeah, somebody in comment just complaining about killing birds with wind turbines. And uh, I always say that that we should just get rid of the of cats because uh, that would solve that problem. Uh, okay, so solar sneaks up the I know I think. Uh, solar sneaks up on them, chapter six, and and this was kind of fun because of course even in 2012 I was kind of all in on solar, and solar was just not even a thing. Uh, Pete, you got your hand up there? Or maybe that's a legacy. Um, okay, so the solar sneaks up on them. Uh, and, and what the projection was, and I, I thought this was kind of an interesting, because I, again, I was looking through the book for the first time in a number of years. Um, there was a quote in there, those who predict the industry simply cannot continue to grow at 50% a year will be surprised to see it growing at 75 to 100% annually instead which again, turned out to be pretty close to true. Um, I don't think anybody really anticipated the kind of uh, dramatic growth in solar that, that took place and, and solar power generation in the US and worldwide even more dramatically. Uh, but we have just seen this almost exponential growth of solar over this time period. Um, and and as I was looking through, I, I kind of had this, I kind of chuckled because there's, here's another quote. He said, by 2016, photovoltaics will begin to rival wind energy as the leading source of renewable energy, uh, except the hydro, which is always excluded because it's boring, so on. Um, articles will begin to appear discussing the various reasons why solar power cannot possibly succeed. Concern about rare earth metals will suddenly make headlines. Citizen groups, in quotes, will protest and complain that all the solar panels cropping up on homes are a blight to the neighbor. So this was um, obviously very predictable and, and certainly did come to pass. And we're going to see it again. And, and now I think we could just safely predict that it's clear that renewable energy and electric vehicles are targeted as one of the next culture war things, just like uh, what was the beer that everybody decided to shoot, you know, Bud Light or whatever it was. Um, you know, it's just a target, no reason, except that by creating culture wars, certain politicians find it advantageous. So this is one. This is one that's going to be uh, our next culture war there. Okay, so um, the oil market convulses. This was my prediction number seven. Uh, I just basically said somewhere in the world, some small event or huge catastrophe will cause oil prices to shoot up over $200 a barrel. Okay, this is my second one where I'm going to say it didn't happen. Um, that was, uh, uh, I, I, and, and I could maybe argue, I could argue here, if you look at the price of oil, um, over that time period, it was pretty con convulsive, uh, up and down and up and down. Um, but it's not what I envisioned. I really did envision there would be something that would just major league disrupt um, the the oil supply world. Um, turned out COVID did, but in the opposite, you know, where the, it, the supply was over a bunch. Uh, I was anticipating something like a, a coup d'etat in Saudi Arabia or some sort of uh, natural disaster event. Uh, yes, I was saying, wait for it. Yeah, it's still, uh, it's just that the, the, the whole petro uh, world is 
so fragile that that I suspect, you know, it's like with any prediction, if you wait long enough. Um, a friend of mine always used to say this economist predicted uh, 11 of the last three recessions. You know, it's it's like, yeah, you can you can predict disaster and eventually. Um, but I, I'm going to give myself not a lose on this because the price never did really even hit a dollar, $120 a barrel. And I would say it would shoot up to 200 so I'm going to say that's a that's a strong miss or a weakness. I guess um, this one was one that that was interesting because I really did get a lot of criticism. Uh, shale gas is a bust because um, because if you remember, if you were in our part of the world back in 2012, shale fracking was going to be it. I mean, it was just people were running out selling mineral rights on their property for $6,000 an acre because this was the next big thing. Um, so I, I was looking at it and thinking, you know, it cannot possibly be the next big thing. Um, these were some quotes from some studies. Uh, the first one was by Credit Suisse, uh, a banking firm, but they found that the costs of production had doubled over the past decade. And that was just simply conventional saying that that the cost of production for a therm of natural gas was over $8 uh, a therm. Uh, Bank of America, they they were saying, you know what, the, the break even is at 664. And fracking is more expensive. So um so it's uh so to me thinking that natural gas is competitive at $3.50 a, a therm, but not competitive. Not it wasn't even competitive with wind and solar back then at eight dollars. So, and plus, when I was when I was doing research for textbooks, I found that a few years before that, everybody was saying, "Is this the natural end of the natural gas industry?" Because the production um, per well was dropping off dramatically. So, so my take on it was fracking is just another in quotes, ex in, in enhanced extraction technique. Uh, the same thing like um, mountaintop removal is for the coal industry. It's a way of eking out another 18 months out of a dying industry by going in and blowing things up um, because that is a more e efficient and cheaper way of extracting. It leaves what you leave behind in kind of a mess, but the, the, the fossil fuel industry really doesn't care about cleaning up their mess. So, so that was what the shale gas industry was, and it, that's what I projected, and that's what it turned out to be. Um, shale gas is just not really a thing. And as I foreshadowed here, that um, this was... During this time period, really all the way from 2014 to 2021, all the natural gas was being sold at a loss. So that's something I never would have projected. Why would these companies continue to behave that way? And, and in many respects, what they were doing was um, they were taking low cost production and subsidizing the high cost production at, at the expense of their industry. And and they tried to milk it. It didn't. It didn't work. They lost share, and they're going to continue to lose share. And now we're starting to see the market react to that. That um, I think natural gas is still going to be a thing, but the natural gas will not be used for electrical production. It'll be used for chemicals. Um, you know, it's it, it. The analogy there I think of is like, why would you burn mahogany and teak as firewood? It has value far in excess of heat um, in other forms. So, so I think that's what we'll see with the natural gas industry. And it's being played out in this year of all the new energy that's being put out there, only two or 3% is natural gas. The rest is wind and solar primarily. So that's, that's a close up of that. Okay, prediction number nine, we're getting down there. Uh, rebirth of the electric car. Uh, and this was fun because at the time, um, is uh, is that, uh, yeah, somebody saying, my prediction is agrivoltaics will allow food production in drier areas, which I, I think is a good prediction. Um, okay, so the rebirth of the electric car, uh, 
this one was was something that I, I did play around with. The electric cars really weren't a thing back then. And I was just feeling that, of course, as we see cheaper and cheaper electricity, um, we're going to see this move uh, towards electric vehicles. And one of the quotes from there was, within 30 years, fully 50% of all passenger vehicles on the road will be either or hybrid. I just saw a report. Um, I forget who was making the prediction. It was it was a big company. Um, anyway, they're anticipating by 2030, 50% will be uh, EVs. So, so this is happening uh, faster than anticipated. Um, I, I went into the very specific predictions in the book. By 2020, the hybrid market will represent more than 10% of the vehicles sold worldwide. And purely electric vehicles will account for another 2% of the fleet. Um, I looked up the numbers. Actually, EVs are 4.7% worldwide and 9.7% uh, percent hybrid. So pretty good, under, under predicted on the EVs. And another thing that I threw in because I'm so, so annoyed with hydrogen, um, because at the time everybody was focusing on hydrogen is going to be the next thing, fuel cells, natural gas vehicles. And I, I did put in here that natural gas and fuel cell vehicles are just going to be insignificant. They're just not going to be a thing. Um, I know they're natural gas or compressed natural gas vehicles. we Saw them a lot in France, the taxi cabs and the like. I don't know if they're still a thing, but they're just not in the in the market. They were doing it because petroleum in France at the time was so expensive. Um, compressed natural gas was actually competitive. I don't know if it still is or if it's not. Okay, and uh, did I skip a slide here? No. Nope. Yeah, and then my 10th prediction is when energy is free. So I just thought this was kind of an interesting way to sum up where we went, where we're going with the book. And, and it, plus it was also very, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, sparks controversy. Um, so anyway, so uh, what I was arguing here in this is not that energy itself would be free, but that the cost of energy approaches zero. Um, and, and so the analogy that I was using is like, if we look at the cost of, of bandwidth, a three minute call from New York to London, we see the cost of that starts out very, very expensive and gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper until effectively the cost of bandwidth is free. Um, but it does not mean you pay nothing for your phone. Um, what it does mean is we transition from a commodity based uh, pricing structure of, say, uh, buying bandwidth to a services-based um, pricing structure where you're buying communication services, which could be, you know, uh, purchase of a mobile phone, your monthly charge, your uh, Netflix account, you know, all of these kind of things become energy services or communication services. You're no longer buying uh bandwidth. Well, my argument here was that electricity will be the same way. Uh, as the cost of generating electricity approaches zero, then we will move away from a pricing structure that's based on commodity. And you will move towards a energy services economy. Um, I still don't know how that's going to look or what that's going to be. Uh, it's obviously a longer term uh, projection, but I think that it's going to come to pass. Uh, and and so you, you can just see it with solar um, in in Australia, you can install solar on your home for less than a dollar a watt. So so they've demonstrated that economically that is a price point. It's not that way in the U.S. for a lot of reasons, uh, reg, uh, you know, tariffs and, and profit motives and over-regulation and over-permitting costs and things like that. But it is theoretically possible. Well, if you're putting it in at a dollar a watt, basically a suburban home, you're talking about a six or $7,000 investment for free energy over the life of that, of that home. Um, that's the cost of a kitchen counter, you know? I mean, effectively free. So, um, so it's, it, is approaching that and will continue to approach that. So how do we find ourselves with a pricing structure that deals with it from that perspective? 
Um, that'll be interesting. It'll be a, a certainly a way of changing how how we view energy. You know, perhaps the energy of a product will be built into the cost of that product, or there'll be monthly subscriptions. Maybe you'll have to pay for who knows what energy services that don't exist today, but you will not be able to live without. So, so I'm going to hold off on that one and say that I'm not really sure um, uh, how that's going to flip, but I, I still will hold with that prediction. So in summary, looking at, looking at all of these projections out of this book, um, I came down to coal down, natural gas up, a win, uh, cheap gas, nope, disappeared, yep, uh, electricity doubled, no, didn't get that. Nuclear power dead, rise of wind and solar, yep. Oil market, no. Shale gas a bus, yeah. Rise of electric vehicle, yeah. Um, when energy's free, who knows? But I'm still holding out that that's going to happen. So, uh, Doug, you've got a question or a comment? Yeah, Jake, nice talk. A uh, couple comments. Um, in um, your electricity prediction, um, did you factor in because they they played a they the, the billing the utilities kind of switched the modus operandi back around 2012 the delivery charge was not separated out so the cost of the electricity included the delivery cost mm -hmm. now when you get your bill they have separated that out so if you're comparing putting solar or whatever on your house what, or self generation of whatever type uh, you really have to baseline it against that delivery cost because you're going to eliminate that as well. So the question, did you actually factor the delivery cost in? Because if you factor that in, you may not be as far as off as you think. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I, I did not. I just took the cost of power that was pr published by EIA. Oh, then you're not very, you're not too far off. Yeah, yeah. So you're right, because, of course, there you've got transmission, you've got distribution, you've got access charges that are popping yeah. up. All of these things, I know our well, bill. Those, those are those are rolled into one thing, so yeah. you need to double check the numbers. Yeah, I remember telling our local um, co-op that you know we have very expensive electricity. We're paying over twenty cents a kilowatt hour. And the co-op guy was like, "No, you don't. You know, we only charge uh, eleven cents." And I was like, "Okay, here's the way I figure it. I take my bill and I divide it by how much power I got, and we're paying twenty cents a kilowatt hour." It's like, oh, but you got distribution and transmission and access. And I said, I don't care how you slice it. It's still cost of power. Hey, and, James, yeah. Isn't your, hey, isn't your a little bit, isn't your bill in particular a little bit slanted because you probably generate most of your own power. So you've only got a little bit of power and you're dividing a normal person's distribution fee over a twelfth of a normal person's energy usage. Yeah. Well, when I was arguing with them, that was before we, we, uh, I, I wasn't counting that, but you're right. And we also get a little slanted because what our co-op did is said, if you have solar, we're going to charge you $44 a month access. If you don't have solar, we're going to charge you $22 a month. Well, that's so, that is that's fair. <laughs> that's, yeah, I know. That, that, that does increase your cost. I'll give you that. Yeah, and I was saying, well, what's what's your point there? You know, and they said, well, you know what? We make costs from selling power and you know, you're not buying as much power, so we've got to subsidize. And I said, well, then why don't you figure out what the true access cost is and charge that for everybody? You know, why are you subsidizing one thing with another? You know, just, just charge the true cost. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Doug, did you have another question or is that your hand still up? No, no, a couple others. So uh, I, I used to teach the energy course at St. Clair here in Dayton. And back in, even as far as like 2008, give or take, <laughs> Memory, memory's a little fuzzy, but that was about the right time. Um, I, I uh, advocate or articulate, I, I still believe this is the way it's probably going to go. Um, eventually, there's still a lot of headroom technologically in solar. Okay, uh, Probably within the next five years or so, we'll have tandem cells coming out, which will push us up in the 28 30% conversion uh, range. Um, we will we will reach a point we can quibble over the year, but it's coming, and it's not it's not 20 years out, where you can put in Ohio, say, uh, solar on your roof or in your yard, and you can your excess electricity you will be able to generate and sell to the utility at wholesale price, and then get revenue coming in, 
and profit from the utilities. And whenever that point is reached, and it's not going to be a single point because it's going to depend on the scale and the orientation, what have you, the installation, but as that, as that transitions, then I believe the utilities will transition more toward a distribution model, which they are in many places anyway. Uh, so from the utility perspective, they don't have to pay the capital expenses, the maintenance expenses, or the risk of damage to the systems. All they have to do is compete you against me for the lowest price. They'll sell it. But there's not enough, you know, there's plenty enough solar to meet the world's energy uh, supply. That's not an issue. But there's not enough for the cities because they're just too dense, the population too dense. So I think we'll see a transition where more the rural, the suburban areas will actually become the power generating. People will sell excess, businesses will sell excess power to the grid, the power companies will transmit it, and then it'll be sold in the cities. So that's that's another thing just to chew on a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you raised a couple of issues that I've thought about. Um, I think, I, I don't believe the utilities are smart enough or spry enough to adapt to the reality that's coming, but I think we'll see something that's um, akin to what happened in the telecommunication industry where some company, what, like a company like Apple or Intel or who knows, um, will create a virtual utility uh, where, where rather than me selling my excess solar, I will be able to sell it into a marketplace. Yeah. Where I will get a better than wholesale return on mine. And this entity will simply be a-, a um, Aggregator. Yeah, an aggregator and a transaction. Uh, They'll take their PayPal fees. I, I think I think the way it'll play out is that some utilities have already embraced this sort of model. Some are kicking and screaming. Uh, my, if I were betting on it, the best bet I would put is say it will be more than rural electric co-ops will introduce it. They tend to be more friendly toward this thing. And then as the as something like this of a, a more distributed generation, more um, micro or nano generator being aggregated and sold, um, eventually they'll come on board, but it'll be, it'll, it'll take a while. Yeah. Well, there was another thing, and I'd encourage you guys to download that book um, and, and look at it. But in that final chapter, I was talking about how, you know, this will lead to the rise of storage, distributed storage system, distributed energy, and probably bi-directional use of electric vehicles as a distributed storage mechanism and the rise of the virtual utility and the virtual power plant. And, and I, think, uh, I think those are all spot on. I would have thought maybe that they're coming quicker, but, but I thought I'd have my flying car by now too. So, you know, who knows? The technology is gonna come, but it tends to come slower in some cases. Let's see, did we have another question there? I thought somebody had a, a hand up as yeah, well. Yeah, this, this is Al. I, I had a question. Uh, Doug brought up a very interesting point, and that's the evolution of solar, solar technology, especially panel technology. And, uh, you know, my panels are five, have been on my roof five years, and uh, I'm not so much concerned about the loss of efficiency of the panels, but in another five years, uh, you know, before the useful life of the panel is up, I wonder if the the uh, technology might advance to the point where it would be cost effective for me because all the all the hardware and all the wiring and everything is there. So if to just swap out uh, for new, more efficient panels uh, and maybe double my production without adding adding more array. Yeah, I think that's going to be a, a big thing, um, which leads to several issues. It's sort of like saying, okay, the tiles in my kitchen are fine, but I want to upgrade. I want to change the look, um, you know, and all of us tinker around those edges. But you're probably very right where I could stick in some new solar panels and they're going to more than pay for themselves in just a couple of years. And then from that point forward, I'm, I'm actually doing better than had I just left the system alone. And, and so people were gonna make those kind of economic decisions. And, and that's just part of the evolution of this. Um, but, and there, there are gonna be systems that do things that your current system doesn't do, like bi-directional EV charging or right. integration in with some other um, systems or sunlight backup like Enphase has and things like that, that you're gonna say, okay, now I gotta swap out my inverter, why don't I swap out the uh, panels? Why don't I do this upgrade? Um, just because there are features there now that didn't exist five years ago. 
And, and so folks will make those decisions, but what do we do with that waste product? You know, that's, that's an issue because, you know, it's, it's, every industry should worry about this, but we seem to be held to a higher standard, uh, you know, that, um, so, so we, I know they're looking at recycling of the panels. Maybe there are alternative uses of these panels. Um, we had a tour the other day with some kids there and had a stack of damaged panels and, uh, and I was, they were saying, what are you doing with these damaged panels? And I said, well, these are being thrown away by utility scale system. So we wanted to check them to see just what percentage of loss is there just because they're cracked. Um, Cause they might still be performing at 95% for all we know. And the kids are like, you can make some cool houses out of this. <laughs> like, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe there are alternatives that are, have nothing to do with electrical generation. Um, I don't know, but we need to come up with something. Yeah, Doug, you had a question or a comment? Yeah, a comment. Um little background uh, so I, i've been uh, i've been in power and energy for over 20 years I, I literally this is literally my first week of retirement uh my last job was i was the director of the air force research lab energy office so i've been doing everything energy for a good while so in that uh and one thing i've advocated with our civil engineering folks which uh, I, i'm getting up against the line politically but now now it's okay <laughs> since i'm retired I, I can do this now um you know, and all the political fray of tariffs and undercutting, what have you. Uh, if you look at the levelized cost of electricity at utility scale, uh, CAD Telluride still, thin film, is most very, very competitive with, with Lazard, who has some good data on that. And I, disclosure, I do not own stock in the company, but here in Ohio, uh, outside of China, the largest solar set manufacturer is in Ohio, of course, they have manufacturing plants in Singapore, Malaysia, and other places. But it's first solar, which is Cat Sure. But uh, uh, and uh, that's often overlooked. But what Ca uh, first solar does is when they sell their panels because of the Cat they want to they want to recycle the tellurium that's in it. The cost includes the recycling. Mm -hmm. So that there are a lot, there, one, one, one black eye that the solar and wind industry gets, and it's a legitimate black eye, is that you don't re include the disposal costs. So they're bearing wind turbines right now out in Wyoming, which is awful. But here we have an American manufacturer who is already the most cost effective at scale utility. They're competitive like crazy. And they build into the cost, the, the, the recycling of the materials. So we don't have to advocate a particular company, but what I advocate is legislation that says, if we're going to give uh, benefit or tariffs or regulations, we give preference to those companies that already have recycling built into it. Mm -hmm. That is an interesting way to push the, the thing without, you don't have to favor any company, but right now it's actually a very good thing for Ohio. <laughs> so just mm -hmm. some politics there. Yeah, and I know um, uh, Cadmium Telluride uh, has an advantage, and one of the reasons they use it a lot in utility scale is it tends to do better in low light um, yes. environments. Uh, not quite so well during peak sunlight, but it, you're basically smoothing out the curve um, over the day and uh, at a, at a much cheaper price. And I know Toledo Solar was trying to move into that technology uh, for, for residential and commercial. Yeah. And we may, we may st still see that. And who knows, maybe we'll get tandem panels, as, as you were mentioning, with, with cadmium telluride and perovskite or something like that. Um, I know they're doing perovskite and silicon. So, so we're still in the floppy disk age of solar. I mean, we're, Absolutely. Still, we're still finding our way, but it's, it's an amazing future for this industry. I mean, it, it will oh, dominate. And, and another point, I just saw the data about uh, oh, about six weeks or so, give or take. Um, first Solar's manufacturing capacity in terms of uh, what capacity is their factory, are their factories running at? They're basically full capacity. Yeah. A number of the Chinese factories are actually like a 25 to 35% capacity. They're struggling. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's kind of a push or shove. But I think there's going to be some shaking out of the industry. In other words, there are going to be some fire sales coming up in about a year. Yeah. Uh, so so for those who are looking, keep, keep an eye out for that. 
I, I think that sort of brings into mind, and this is a very uninformed opinion, but I think uh, most of my uninformed opinions are, are usually better than my informed opinions, but uh, uh, is, is the high cost and high energy of silicon manufacturing. Well, China's already won that, that, that battle as far as production. So why are we now trying to replicate what they've already done? Why not move into where, where thin film panel manufacturing is a much less expensive, much less energy intensive process. So, so maybe we reinvent the solar panel industry and dominate, let them go first generation and have, have all the sub costs. Now yeah. we're coming in second generation with uh, you know wireless rather than with landlines and we actually um, start to, uh, to see some significant profits. Yeah. Okay, Bill, I'm going to let you in, and then we're going to close it out because we're out of time. So, Bill, jump on in. One of the things that I think is is driving the domestic uh, manufacturing in the here is the fact that Chinese panels that are exported to the United States very often have a different characteristic. They're manufactured very often by contract manufacturers in third party countries, and Sometimes those those manufacturers cut the quality uh, significantly. We got a batch of panels that had no anti-reflective uh, shield uh, uh, coating on the front of the panels. So there was a dramatic difference between the, the quality of the panels that were made in China and those that were made in third countries that were exported to. Mm, okay. All right. Well, that's a good point. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. A good discussion. And uh, we'll meet again in two weeks uh, for our Solar Noon Tuesday. If you have any ideas for topics, send them my way. In the meantime, thanks everybody for your attention. Thanks, Jay. All right. Thanks, Jay.